Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our online worship here at Bethany uh, this morning on this Sunday, which is Remembrance Sunday 2021. We join together once again those who will be worshipping via this recording and those worshipping live with me here in the church uh, today. We come together to bring our lives before God, to worship him in times of war and in times of peace, to recognise his glory, his sovereignty over our lives for now and for all time. As we come to worship on this Remembrance Sunday, let's hear again the words of the psalmist. Come and see what the Lord has done. See the amazing things he has done on this earth. He stops wars all over the world. He breaks the bow. He shatters the spear. Stop fighting, he says, and know that I am God, supreme among the nations, supreme over all the world. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. As we gather to remember those who have died in war, we also remember the one who has given ultimately all for us and before all will ultimately bow. Let us pray. Holy God, our Heavenly Father, we come this morning to remember your love and your goodness to us. We come to offer you our praise and our worship. You alone are worthy to receive all of our praise. We come also to remember, to honour, and then to be refreshed by you, refuelled with your promises that enable us indeed to persevere in a world where people disown and doubt you. We come this morning, Lord, also to remember those, Father, who have given their lives for the defence of our land and our freedoms. As we wonder at their sacrifice, may we remember, too, the ultimate sacrifice of love that you have given to us in our Lord Jesus Christ. The sacrifice of love to hearts like ours, which are undeserving. Lord, we come to you this day. We give you our thanks. We offer you our worship. In the name of him who came and who suffered and who died for us, Jesus Christ, our Saviour, and the one who has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. Friends, we come now to this simple time of remembrance and the two-minute silence. I hope you will observe it as I introduce it today. We remember in a world of violence the dead of all the world's wars. Those we knew, those of whom we have heard in stories, those once called enemies, who now live beneath the same sky as we do. Those whose lives were taken for nothing more than they happened to live or where they indeed chanced to go. We will remember them. We will remember them. We remember in, in, in a world of justice all of those who continue to grieve the loss of loved ones, of friends, 
of homes, of communities. All those who continue to yearn for work and peace and reconciliation. All those who continue to live in hope despite the tragedy of their circumstances. We will remember them. We will remember them. Friends, let us remember in silence before God all of those who have died in war. They shall not grow old, as we who are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them. Almighty Father, you call us, your children, to live as brothers and sisters to love and to be in harmony. You have given us your son to be our saviour, the Prince of Peace. Grant that we who are called then by your name may yield our lives to your sacrifice and strive always for reconciliation, understanding and peace in our relationships. We ask it for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Our reading this morning is the letter of James and chapter 4 and verses 1 to 10. James chapter 4 verses 1 to 10. Where do the fights and quarrels among you come from? They come from your desires for pleasure, which are constantly fighting within you. You want things, but you cannot have them, so you are ready to kill. You strongly desire things, but you cannot get them, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have what you want, because you do not ask God for it. And when you ask, you do not receive, because your motives are bad. You ask for things to be used for your own pleasures. Unfaithful people, don't you know that to be this world's friend means that you are God's enemy? People who want to be the world's friends make themselves God's enemies. Don't think that there is no truth in the scripture that says the spirit that God placed in us is filled with fierce desires. But the grace that God gives to us is even stronger. As the scriptures also say, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So then, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you hypocrites. Be sorrowful and cry and weep and change your laughter into crying, your joy into gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Hear the word of the Lord for our lives for today. Friends, one of the significant characteristics of Remembrance Sunday is that in the face of war, and in the face of suffering, and recognising those we know have sacrificed their lives for us, we come very humbly to this moment. It's poignant, it's generally sombre, as we remember them, and as we thank God too for the peace that is now generally ours because of what they have done. One of the people who has done much for this particular day, certainly in recent years, is the D-Day veteran, Harry Billinge, the 96-year-old poppy fundraiser, who's a regular feature now of the BBC's coverage. Of course, he most notably has campaigned for years to have a proper memorial set up in France for the British soldiers who died on D-Day. You know, I'm sure that others have had the same idea. And perhaps they have made plans, obviously, for such a memorial. But it's been Harry who's been the public face of its establishment. And it was great to see him visiting the new memorial when it was opened. Harry himself, though, has such a strong and a straightforward way of expressing things. You're really drawn to him and to his memories of D-Day. But they're always recalled, aren't they, with a tear in his eyes. Not for him necessarily, but of course for all his colleagues who didn't make it on that day. And one of his famous sayings is simply that I wasn't brave, I was lucky. Remember those of my colleagues who weren't so lucky. You know, friends, also as I go back into my Bible and as I consider straight talking like that, I'm drawn to the letter of James. No one in the New Testament does straight talking like James has done. Even our Lord himself, I think, would struggle to keep up. I think it's got a lot to do with the fact that James, now remember he was the leader of the first Jerusalem church, Perhaps he's rather more or less well known, perhaps his more illustrious namesake, of course, the Apostle James, the brother of John, who actually died very early on in church history, according to Acts. But really, this Jerusalem church, which James led, prided itself with being the traditional, if you like, the conservative outfit. 
holding and standing by the promises of Christ. When compared, of course, to the Apostle Paul and the work that he did in establishing new churches in many and in varied places away from Jerusalem. The church there was the figurehead. They saw themselves as being that. They remained staunchly in Jerusalem. They guarded the mission and the vision of the resurrected Christ in an ever-changing uh, Israelite world in those days. James's letter then comes from this traditional and I think straight-talking understanding. And you see this throughout all the instructions that he then gives. Remembrance Sunday particularly took me to this section at the start of James's fourth chapter. It begins, I think, from the thought of war. What causes quarrels and fights among you, he says? And the answer is given. They come from your desire for pleasure, which are constantly fighting within you. Yes, there is war going on within all of us. Do you know, I think we know this is so true. Anytime we perhaps are called to be humble or to submit to someone else, it means that perhaps our ways are not being honoured. What we thought isn't actually going to happen. And we can easily get frustrated by all of that. And we can easily also get bitter and resentful as people. James gives us, doesn't he, the full gamut of what that actually leads to. Ending really in fights and death and destruction in this passage. And this could be, you know, the description of any and every war. And how good we all are, it seems, of continuing to start them. Insurrections, friends, are going on right now in various places in Africa and, of course, still in the Middle East. Governments are being toppled in places like Yemen and Sudan and Haiti. Military rule is there now in, in Chad, Myanmar and other places like that. And all of it inevitably leads to unnecessary death, the breakdown of communications, fighting amongst families, and the lack of provisions for ordinary folk trying to live peacefully on the ground. And that, of course, means starvation for many, and a refugee crisis which now extends the world over of those who are simply trying to escape from disaster and from death in the place they used to call their home. They want to find a place of peace, a place of prosperity for them and for their families. You know, of course, on this Sunday, we tend to focus on what we would call the two world wars, as we refer to them. But really, friends, the world remains at war with itself, with all its differences of belief and culture and, of course, religion. The words of James then, straight talking as they are, perhaps sit rather nervously with us still, but yet reveal the truth that is so clearly reported among us in one way or another. And that's the simple fact that we can't live in peace with our neighbours. What then is the answer? And is there a lesson here for this Sunday of remembrance? as we wear our poppies, remember themselves symbols of war and of bloodshed. The simple fact, friends, is that peace, as we perhaps would perceive it today, as we hope for it in our lives, begins not with the society that's around us, but with the God who is within us. Just these last two weeks, as many of you will know, my family and I have been isolating, having been tested positive for COVID-19 on the 1st of November. And it's been quite a sobering thing, as I guess it has been for everyone who's been in the same position. And you know, I've thought about all the things which are going on inside my body. 
Together, uh, in one way or another, we've all had the classic symptoms, feelings of cold uh, and flu, uh, raised temperatures, and for me particularly, quite a tight chest as well. And then we've had the one also that we've all been told about, the loss of taste and the loss of smell. Eating in the manse has been happening. And I know what most of my food is supposed to taste like and to smell of. But yet that sensation has disappeared. I still enjoyed my food, but yet it was an eerie and a blank enjoyment. Fortunately, of course, with, with our double COVID vaccinations, what we have suffered has only been mild symptoms, and now we're fully recovered. And we thank the Lord for all of those who have told so hard to develop and distribute these injections that we have all had. And I think to a certain extent we frown on all of those who are still protesting about having them at all. As you read this passage in James, it really is like the battle of the virus that I've known that's been being fought inside of me these past few weeks. COVID has done its best in my body. And we know of so many who have suffered and indeed died right at the start of the pandemic. But my good bacteria, of course, laced now with the vaccination molecules, have fought and have overcome. The struggle inside, I think, is a reality for all of us, whether or not we are suffering from disease or whether or not even we're battling with our own opinions. Of course, for James, and I pray for all of us too, the struggle comes back to God. And with this stark contrast that we all face, that if we become friends with the world, then we become the enemies of God. Now, is that true? It's certainly stark. It's certainly black and white. Surely, friends, we can do things in the world, but yet retain our faith and our belief in God. And James, in a very stark way, says to us, that is impossible. And although we might be at peace in our communities today, as I've already said, we actually know that it's impossible for, for peace to dominate in the whole world, as perhaps we would glibly wish it. There is simply something about our human nature deep within that says to us, I want my own way. I want my voice to be heard. And we know too that there are simply too many voices for them all to be equally accepted. The sad reality of our lives on this Remembrance Sunday is that war remains a thing that is in the present. It is in all of us. And it will be there into the future as well. But of course the passage ends with a call. And it's a call to come to God in our lives. Actually, friends, the term is submit to God. And that's a powerful and a committed turning to him. It entails that we lose our own rights. Submission means that we forfeit all we might be fighting for within and without. And we surrender to someone else's authority. Once again, James is straight talking in this respect. Come near to God, he says. Wash your hands. And of course, we know how important that's been in recent days. Purify your hearts as well. And that's addressed to hypocrites. Those who easily speak one way, of course, but then are thinking something entirely different. And then weep and cry and be sorrowful before what I consider to be the best and the most complete instruction that James ever gives. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Remembrance, friends, reminds us that there have been so many soldiers over the years who have submitted to the command of their commanding officers. The command to rise up the command to fight, to serve king and queen, 
and country. Most of us friends would have not known exactly what effect that had had. Many having obeyed that command fell down wounded or dying pretty shortly afterward. But yet it is in that submission to that higher authority that a true life's calling is actually found. It is as we humble ourselves before someone who we know commands life and death that our own true humanity really is experienced. Do you know James gives us this teaching for Remembrance Sunday because he knows there is an ultimate authority in this world and for all time, that is the Lord our God, the one responsible for all of life, the one who has demonstrated his love in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. And it's only by humbling ourselves before him that finally we will be lifted up. Friends, on this Remembrance Sunday, we have come to remember those who have fought and died and still do so for the freedoms we enjoy in our country. And our call, made by old soldiers like Harry Billinge, is to remember those who have humbled themselves and paid the ultimate price for doing so. It is also a call to pause, to remember that warfare is a continuing reality. And sadly, it always will be in this world. Because we know that deep within, even in our own hearts and lives, we struggle and fight for our rights, which are different perhaps to the rights of those around us, whether we are infected, of course, with COVID-19 or not. And then to reflect, and finally, that war does teach us something. And that is the necessity of submission to the higher authority, the ultimate and complete loving authority too for our lives and in this world. He is the one who has demonstrated both his love and his power. And it's only, friends, when we truly humble ourselves before the Lord that the Lord himself will ultimately lift us up. Friends, let us affirm his word, his ways and his life. Even as we pause to remember on this Remembrance Sunday. Thanks be to God for his word today. Amen. We come to God now with a prayer of response to God's word. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open and from whom no secrets are hidden, we bring our war-torn lives to you on this Remembrance Sunday. As we reflect on conflict, past and present, and as we have made our thanksgiving in silence for the fallen, we remember our own battles within and without. We are conscious of how far we have fallen, and we are aware of those who we have hurt or forsaken. We know that within each of us is the capacity for peace and for war. As we come this day, we know too that the only good answer to this conflict that we all face is submission to you, holy and perfect Father Almighty. We thank you for the battle that you have already fought for us in Jesus Christ our Lord, for the submission that we can now make to make that life from you possible. Lord, as we bring our lives in worship today then, Grant that we may forsake violence in all its forms and submit always to the command of our commanding officer, 
in what we do, in our lives, as well as deep within our hearts and minds. As we present ourselves this day, enable us also to live in peace and cause us always to work for peace with those around us and with this world. In the name of Christ our Lord Almighty, we present our prayers today. And friends, we share a prayer as well for a world which is still at war. And we ask God, the God of peace, to bring his life to this world and into our lives. Let us pray. God of life and of death, of peace and of war, yours is the battle against evil. Yours is the victory over death. We pray to you this day, with memories and stories of war and death before us. We recognise and offer our thanks for all of those who have fought bravely and died to secure victory. Today, as we perhaps sit in peace, we thank you for their sacrifice, which has made that peace possible for us. And we pray for those still fighting, not only in the wars we know about, but in those smaller conflicts in our world today, which have either dropped from news reports or that we simply don't understand or know anything about. Lord, may people everywhere look to resolve difference through peaceful methods rather than with violence. Lord God of our Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you too for the stories in your word which tell us all about what you have done and what you have achieved through his life and through his death. And we thank you that as we put our trust in Jesus, put our hope in those stories and in that sacrifice, that Jesus himself truly does walk with us and in us, helping us through all of the storms of life. Lord, we remember and stand alongside those today whose lives have been affected by war. But also the battle with all our lives, the battle, of course, for recognition. The battles, too, against illness and infirmity. The battles of grief for those we have lost and the battles of peace, of hope, for a better tomorrow. Lord, then bring your strength and your peace and your hope into hearts and lives the world over. Help us to recognise your peaceful presence every day and to live our lives knowing that we can walk with you wherever we are. Lord Jesus, our saviour, our friend, you bear the scars of victory and of peace with God. So grant this day a fresh understanding of you in our hearts and lives and help us to put our trust in you for the future so that the whole world might discover and know your peace, which is your purpose for us all. We ask it through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the world continue to surprise us, love continue to astonish us, life continue to captivate us, and faith continue to sustain us. And may God go with us always, this Remembrance Sunday and forever. Amen.